Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another of the Harry Ransom Center's Collection Connections series of programs. I'm Kathy Henderson, the Center's Associate Director for Education and Exhibitions, and it's my sincere pleasure to welcome you today. If you haven't yet seen our previous three Collection Connections events, you can find videos of them on the Center's YouTube channel. And to ensure you do not miss future online events, I hope you will consider following the Center on its various social media channels. We'll reserve time at the end of today's program for questions from those of you watching, so please feel free to post your questions in the comments field throughout our conversation. Before we get started, I'd like to thank my colleagues at the Ransom Center who make these programs possible. Lisa Pulsifer, our Head of Public Programs and Education, Doug Newell, our Senior Media Support, Support Technician, and Randy Ragsdale, our Communications and Marketing Manager. I'm so pleased to be in conversation today with novelist, playwright, and illustrator Edward Carey, who is an Associate Professor in the Department of English here at the University of Texas at Austin. Perhaps best known as author of the novel Little and the Young Adult Trilogy, Ironmonger Trilogy, Edward Carey's most recent work is The Swallowed Man, a fiction which imagines how Geppetto, who fashioned the puppet Pinocchio, passed the time during the two years he spent in the belly of a giant shark. An incident, I understand from Edward, that was barely touched on by Carlo Collodi, author of that classic a work of Italian literature. Hello, Edward. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's a real pleasure to be in conversation with you. Hi, Kathy. It's amazing to be here. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's just really wonderful. So can we start by your telling us how you came to write The Swallowed Man? Yes, absolutely. So it all started off with, um, to begin with, I was living in Florence and I was working as a, I, I've been invited to be a writer in residence at a children's hospital uh, in the city. And it's one of the most amazing children's hospital uh, I, I've ever, ever come across. It's sort of modern and it doesn't smell like a hospital and it's full of clowns and it has dogs and it's <laughs> and violinists marching backwards and forwards. And, and I was there to talk to the, the kids about, about stories and just to mix with kids from oncology or whatever, in whatever department. Um, and the thing about the hospital is it's full of, of Pinocchio. There's Pinocchio everywhere. There's uh, Carlo Colori, Carlo Lorenzini was his real name, um, uh, um, lived in Florence most of his life. And he's and, and Pinocchio is a very Tuscan um, uh, uh, character. So I wrote about Pinocchio as a character um, connected to illness because many of the, the surgeons and uh, doctors I talked to talked about the journey that Pinocchio takes from a puppet to being a real child. Is, is, is also a narrative of coming to health. Um, and so I wrote about this, and then the, the Collodi Foundation in Collodi itself, um, Carlo Collodi named himself after, after the small town of Collodi, um, just uh, not far from Florence, said, would I do an exhibition for the Parco di Pinocchio, the Pinocchio Park in, in, um, in Collodi? And I said, yes. Of course, absolutely. I would, nothing would be, give me greater pleasure. Um, they said, all right, here's the space. It's a nice space. Um, it just needs to relate to 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 Pinocchio. So I read Pinocchio, and I I, I read it and reread it and reread it and reread it. And and as you say, as I went through it, I realized that that Collodi leaves Geppetto for two years inside the belly of an enormous sea creature. And I thought, well, what would he do? What would he do for two years? And he's an artist. He created his son, after all. He would have to make art. So I thought I would make the art that Geppetto made while he was stuck inside the belly of this enormous shark, as it is in the in the book. Um, Disney makes it into a whale. Um, and as I was doing it, I thought, no, 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 no. Come on, you're missing an opportunity. It needs also to be a journal. It needs to be something like Robinson Crusoe, how to how to survive two years inside a whale. Now we're one year into a pandemic, um, but it almost gave me sort of instructions on how to try to survive um, in this sort of uh, lockdown. Um, but Geppetto's is a particular um, particular sort of lockdown. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's, that's how it started. And it, and it grew from, 
It grew from me sitting in this actual chair with the blinds drawn down. I started to imagine what Geppetto's isolation would have been like. Amazing. And um, how long did it take you to actually put that exhibition together? It's, I, they gave me, you know, something like eight months. Can you do it in eight months? I said, uh, yeah, sure, I can do it in eight months. And so I, you know, did it slowly and I began to, you know, do it every day and imagine Whoa, what else, what else, what else could he do? What, what else could you better do? What could he, what would he have with him? And, and I just thought he would run out of ink. We know that the, the Collodi at least gives him, there's a ship that's inside the belly of the beast as well. And so he uses that as his home. Um, but I also thought, oh my God, he'd run out of ink. But then, but then what happens if, um, you know, the shark is eating all the time. So I thought, oh, an octopus would come in and he would get the ink from the octopus. And so I started drawing in squid ink. Um, and so there was all sorts, I just kept on thinking, what could he do? I went to Uncommon Objects here in Austin and there was this enormous bone for sale. And I said, yes, of course, the, the, the shark has swallowed this bone and Geppetto sees it as a surface on which to paint. And he paints a, a skyscape, which he calls his window. So he can look out onto the skies. He can't see the sky, he's in the dark. He can just see by candlelight. And we know that he's rescued by Pinocchio in the book when he's down to his last, last candle. So I slowly kind of thought, what else could he create to, to keep himself occupied, to keep himself alive, to also to remind himself what it is to be a human being. So was the writing of The Swallowed Man concurrent with your work on the exhibition or did it follow your exhibition work? It was absolutely done in tandem. It was how it had to be that I had to keep juggling one with the other because otherwise otherwise it wouldn't feel authentic. So he would go, so he would, I would feel Geppetto would be so lonely today. What could he do? And he would start to think about all the loves of his life. And he would, he would paint small portraits of the different women that he had loved on pieces of driftwood. So I would slowly imagine, you know, what else, how else can he busy his days? God knows we feel this now, don't we? You know, the days, every day almost seems a sort of Sunday, Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. And I just thought, oh, come on, what can you do? What can you do? And so I got into in makeup stories. And, and so I'm making the objects at the same time, absolutely, they had to, they had to be with each other. He had to do self portraits of himself deteriorating. Um, inside this, as he's slowly being digested. Yeah, that's a pretty fascinating conceit in that uh, novella. And I was also really excited by how you characterized every additional thing that came to Geppetto as the shark kept swallowing new things as the post. <laughs> I just thought that was really delightful. So I have a second question for you. Um, You've obviously traveled extensively and lived over the world, but have resided now in Austin more or less straight on for the last 10 years. So I'm curious to know how you got introduced to the Ransom Center once you arrived in Austin. Well, I knew of it before, um, and I knew of it in a particular way, is that it, when I was um, a, a younger writer, I was lucky enough to go and stay with the novelist John Fowles. And I used to, um, uh, sit across from Fowles at his desk um, and, and, and we'd communicate and, and, and he was incredibly generous, brilliant man. And then I discovered when I got here, that desk was in the ransom center. And so it was almost like, oh my God, there you are again. It's an old friend. Um, and so it was just like, oh God. Um, and though I have been living in, in, in Austin for, I think it's 11 years now or something, which is the longest we've ever lived anywhere. We travel as, as often as we can. Of course, we've been stuck here now, but you know, my traveling would be going to, to the Ransom Center. Um, the English department, for, for those of you who don't know, is right next to the is right next to the Ransom Center, and the English department looks such like a beautiful building from the outside, but inside, it's a, it's a disaster. It's it, it, it's a, it's it's monstrous. Um, it's a very unpleasant building, and I would escape over to the Ransom Center, um, and and then sort of bathe in. I would go and look up Posada or something like that, and and I would just sit and. And, and feel and feel you know blessed. Um, don't get me wrong. I love teaching in the English department, but, but 
it's a monster of a building inside it. Um, and so, you know, all my time um, being here, it, I would, I would, I can take breaks. It's just like the the biggest blessing. I used to have a great job in in London just after I left university. I was a stage doorkeeper in over West End Theatre, and I used to go to the National Gallery and hit in my lunch break. Uh, but here, I felt I have exactly the same thing. In my lunch break, I can just walk across to the Ransom Centre and just get lost, even if it's I can spend like five minutes. Here's a Gutenberg Bible. Okay, here we go. Or there's an <laughs> exhibition on Alice on Lewis Carroll, Carroll's Alice. I can get lost there. So. It's sometimes for me actually going to the Ransom Center is almost like going home. I miss England. I love it here, but I miss England desperately. And I can touch England um, by being with the objects in the Ransom Center. Yeah, uh, architecturally, we're kind of the opposite of the English department. They're in a beautiful building and we're in a rather brutalist one. <laughs> I won't begin to critique uh, the inside of the English department building. Uh, but it's delightful that you find a second home here at the Ransom Center. So before the pandemic uh, shuttered the center and drove us all into Gebetto-like quarantine, uh, you and I were planning an exhibition of artwork you created for the Florence exhibition and the Swallowed Man book. And alongside your creations, we were planning to display various items from the center's collections that have inspired you in general and perhaps the Swallowed Man in particular. Can we talk about a few of those and how they relate to your work right now? Yeah, absolutely. It was a, kind of a joy to be able to, to do this exhibition. And I'm, you know, so much has disappeared down the moor of COVID um, and, um, and I regret it, but at least we can, we can be here. So here we go. I can see this one of the- Okay, so here we're doing a couple of things. We're starting with a Ransom Center collection item, which is a lock of Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley's hair from one of the more curious uh, items at the Ransom Center that's always requested for show and tell. And it's uh, an album actually of locks of hair of various historical and literary figures uh, collected by the romantic poet and critic Lee Hunt, um, which passed down through his family until it was auctioned off in 1921 and purchased by Miriam Letcher Stark of Orange, Texas whose library is now part of the Ransom Center's collections. And complementing this are a couple of images from The Swallowed Man, a self-portrait of a heavily bearded Geppetto, and then a couple of brushes, which I'm gonna let you talk about. But I have a framing question to ask you before we um, begin that. Um, this Layhunt lock of hair um, was actually collected from Mary Shelley, if I'm reading the date right, either December 3rd or December 30th, 1820, which would have been when she was 23, year olds, 23 years old and two years after the publication of her novel, Frankenstein. But this particular Victorian predilection to collect locks of hair and, and frequently even fashion them into jewelry um, as a sort of memento mori uh, is kind of mirrored in the swallow man and that Geppetto carried with him at all times a miniature portrait on goat vellum of the sleeping Pinocchio and a chip of wood rather than a lock of hair from his carving of Pinocchio that he kept in a tobacco tin, um, sort of bringing his prodigal son closer to him. We'd love to see those two items up close if you have them on hand and to hear more about what you think of that particular Victorian tradition and how it's reflected uh, especially perhaps in your portrait of Geppetto and brushes that he used to paint while he was inside the whale. Yeah, I, I didn't know, despite uh, um, exploring the, the Ransom Center collection, I didn't know about the hair collection until a student of mine during, um, a master's student during a class in fairy tales. Um, I teach fairy tales to the MFA students in creative writing. And we were talking about Rapunzel. And she said, did you know that, that, that the Ransom Center has the hair of Milton and Keats and, and Browning and Bronte and Poe and Marie Antoinette? And I went, are you crazy? I couldn't believe it. It seemed to be so extraordinary. Um, but also most heartbreaking that, that Mary Shelley's hair um, is here. I, I find it incredibly moving. The, the Victorian obsession with objects 
and with mourning. You know, Victoria, Queen Victoria spent so much time in mourning and the whole business of grief was a massive industry um, in Victorian times. And I was so, I was so moved by the business of, of actually, actually being able to, you know, it's wonderful to touch writers' notes. It's wonderful to see their, their books, but to actually see her hair after all this time is, a, is something so personal. I find it profoundly, profoundly moving. And um, as I was writing um, the, um, the Swallowed Man, I really thought, and it was due to this student who told me about the hair, that, oh my God, this morning is such an extraordinary thing. And I do, um, I do have those objects um, that I can, I, I can show, but just thinking about Frankenstein, um, Frank in, in, in um, Mary Shelley's extraordinary novel, of course, Frankenstein creates a creature, Frankenstein's monster. And I feel like Geppetto is very similar to Frankenstein, that he creates Pinocchio. It's an object that has come to life and um, is deeply distressing and, and disturbing. Um, so to be able to have an exhibition and to be able to have this talk now, and I can see it, I can see her hair, is something <laughs> that is so thrilling and strange and macabre, but most of all beautiful. It's a proof of life which is what these objects were. Okay, it may not be to everybody's taste, but I think, I think they're just astounding and, and, and incredibly beautiful. Can you just uh, speak a little bit about the construction of the brushes that Geppetto used? Yeah. So, so, so the, 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 the self-portrait of Geppetto, which is of the frontispiece to, um, to uh, The Swallowed Man, and I was actually thinking of, um, uh, Blake's uh, drawing of Eurism, which we'll come to later on. Um, uh, as I was thinking of this, this bearded, this man in distress, looking, looking, looking out. Um, but as you can see, um, uh, Geppetto's beard grows longer and longer, and in fact, he becomes very proud of it in the novel. Um, but he he can't paint because he has no brushes, and he thinks, "Oh my God." Of course, I've got hair everywhere. It's the one thing that's actually growing now. Uh, and he, so he has, he cuts his, he cuts his beard and makes them into brushes. And as you see them there, so I had to make them. Uh, you know, I wonder, come on, do this. You know, if you say this is doable, do it. Um, but my, um, I, I'm presenting my chin right now has 50 year, years of, of beard growth. I can't <laughs> grow a beard. So I couldn't provide beard myself, but I went to a friend who, a very hirsute friend and said, could I have some? Uh, and he said, yes. Uh, and so from his beard, I made, um, I made these, these, um, these uh, paint brushes. It's, it's wonderful. Um, did you actually paint with them? Yes, a little bit. It wasn't that easy. <laughs> I, I, yeah, it doesn't look like you can put much of a point on them. Yeah, well, I, 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 I did try and, you know, one could see that one could do it. His hair, his hair, after all, was spectacularly long by that time, Geppetto's. But do you want me to show you on the bigger screen these, these two objects? Should I? Uh, yes, I'll stop sharing. Uh, I think this will work. Yeah. So, so I, I'm going to put this. How is how's that? So that looks great. So this is this is. I got some vellum and drew um, Pinocchio on uh, on 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 this piece of vellum. And I, as Geppetto, I make Geppetto draw him as if he was a child. So there's this sort of sense of mourning, and and he drew him while he was sleeping. So it looks like it may be a death portrait, but it was actually literally taken from life. He was there um, sleeping when he took it. And the other, and the other, and the other pieces, if you could just, just see this in this tobacco tin, there is a little piece, according to Pinocchio, of the original, of the original wood uh, that he used to make, um, to make his, his child. It's just lovely. I'm gonna go back. Um, oh wait, I think I'm there already. Okay. Um, so here we have three other of your creation, two of your creations juxtaposed against 
um, a maquette of Robert De Niro as the creature in the 1994 film, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. And there are some remarkable um, similarities, <laughs> it seems to me. But as Geppetto is carving his marionette, he grows increasingly terrified of it, yet is unable to stop calling it when it is fully, um, sorry, when it is fully formed. Um, it, and when it's fully formed, he keeps calling it the dreadful object. Mary Shelley similarly describes Dr. Frankenstein's creation as the creature. There's a tension here, it seems to me, between the compulsion to create and the fear of the creation itself. And I'm just curious to know if you feel this in your own work. Um, I feel like whenever I'm creating work, it tends to turn dark and gothic and grotesque, even if I don't necessarily want it to. Um, and though I'm never frightened as I'm creating monsters or, um, for example, in the swallowed man, uh, Geppetto inside the inside the belly of the shark actually makes another drunk one night makes another wooden puppet which he calls ill face that seems to haunt him whether he actually made it or not and what I have to what I think writers have to do is to push their characters to the furthest they could possibly go and so they are petrified and so they are they are terrified um, and they're, and in that terror, they they end up revealing more of themselves. They are um, more than they you know more than they more than they would be otherwise. Um, and so I'm not frightened. I'm never frightened. I love creating monsters. In fact, I couldn't stop. I was kind of the, uh, there was a novel that I started working on um, during the during the pandemic and. Um, uh, here we go. This is a bus. Uh, um, We're back. Sorry. And and I had to I had to abandon that because it was it was too dark to be doing now. But it didn't frighten it didn't frighten me. It was just not the right time. Um, I love to be I love to be frightened. I love to make monsters and and creatures. And I and and if people can see that the the there's a the the bust there's a bust of Pinocchio which is also sitting beside me now. But the, there's a bust self-portrait of Geppetto with seaweed as his hair. Yes. Um, yeah, and his beard are rusted nails. Um, and part of the, um, I, all these was collected, there were all sorts of objects um, collected from, um, from the Thames at low tide um, or from Provincetown, um, uh, from the shore in Provincetown in Massachusetts. Uh, and friends actually were to go, I need some seaweed, because uh, there's not much seaweed on hand in Austin, Texas. Um, and, and, and these wonderful boxes would arrive from Massachusetts with, uh, with seaweed uh, and fishnet and things like that. Um, but I also love the Robert De Niro um, bust, uh, which is deeply terrifying um, and, and kind of very, and, and very moving, of course, at the same time. Yeah, I do find it very poignant uh, in its own way. And it would have been amazing to have these busts together. I think they would have talked to each other. And I'm hoping they do that a little bit here. Yeah, they do. <laughs> do you think you'll pick up that novel you abandoned at a future point? Yes, I think so. I mean, it was just, you know, it's such a strange time. And I read, there was a novel that I kind of wanted to write and I started writing that, and 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 I will be submitting it to um, a publisher in um, in a couple of weeks. So I've written it since since oh. March last year. That's wonderful to know. We look forward to it. So here's um, an image you referenced earlier from the Ransom Center collections, which is a hand colored print of William Blake's Horizon whose bearded face you felt uh, Geppetto so closely resembled. And we also have here another curious object from the Ransom Center's collections. Although, I wanna go back to this for a minute and just also mention that William Blake, the poet, prophet and illustrator um, is also represented in the Ram Ransom Center by one of the uh, first editions of his perhaps most popular book of poetry, Songs of Innocence. But 
But this is something quite different, and it's a piece of driftwood that the British novelist Jim Crais found on one of his uh, seaside strolls. And in looking at it, uh, a phrase came to him, which he didn't make immediate use of, but later incorporated into one of his fictions. So it's a very kind of curious draft of a novel um, that you can find in the Ransom Center's collections. But you are an author illustrator like William Blake and discuss on your website some other doubly gifted creative figures who have influenced you. How does your writing stand apart from your work as an illustrator? Or are the two activities integral in some way to one another? They, they are now, at this point, they are totally married. I couldn't, I couldn't do a piece of writing without there being some sort of art involved. I'm so pleased to see this piece of William Blake, I have to say. It's like oxygen just to see it. Um, um, William Blake is one of those artists that means so much to me, and I know to many, many people. As a, as a kid, I was supposed to go into the Royal Navy, and I went to naval school. And when I was at naval school, they would occasionally let us go up to on school trips to London. And I remember the school trip I took to the, to, to the Tate, it's now Tate Britain, but then it was just the Tate in London. And to see, and I saw William Blake for the first time. And I just fell in love with the vision of his world. He is the patron saint of artists, illustrators. He's like our God. Um, and and every you, the, that world he creates, I saw the ghost of the flea, the Tate. I just, and it's so personal and it's so particularly him. And it's so exciting. And I, as I remember another, another time in London, going to the National Art li Library and, and, and uh, requesting a piece of William Blake and then bringing it to me and going, what you bring me? A piece of William Blake. And the fact that they actually have, you have here in Ransom Center, this glorious piece of your eyes and, and, and look at the seas. It feels very Geppetto to me. Um, it's so, it's so beautiful. He was so extraordinary. And he was also so cut off on a limb. You know, he did this in a in his small house in Lambeth. Um, you know, he's the, he's he's in retreat. He's not accepted by the establishment. He was became beloved, you know, much later. Um, but the, his his absolute pressure, belief in himself to go his own way is something that is so exciting and inspiring and that you can do both. And I remember the first time I published a book, um, uh, my first novel, people said, why do you want illustrations? It's not a children's book. There needs to have illustrations. This is part of my vision. I, if I can't see my characters, if I can't physically make them in, in two-dimensional or three-dimensional, I don't feel I know them properly. Um, and, and Blake is like, the, you know, was the person who kind of started me off on this, that you're going to actually mm -hmm. do this, and that he did it with such beauty and idiosyncrasy. I mean, you, there's no mistaking a piece of Blake when you see it. And it's just, it's just a joy. And to actually be able to, to, to step across from the rather dubious confines of the English department to the Ransom Center and be in the presence of William Blake is just an extraordinary gift. As an Englishman living in, Tex in Texas, it, it, it's, it's like touching home. Are there other author illustrators represented in the collection that you're familiar with? Oh uh, yeah, I think there, there's all sorts of wonders that you have. You, Edward Lear is a, is a, is um, is a is a is a writer illustra, illustrator. I, I adore and even and, and and even more the other Edward Edward Gorey that you have uh, a ton of his work to go and just spend an afternoon just going at the you know the university sketches of Edward Gorey just think. Oh, come on, it's like, what could be better? And it's actually endlessly inspiring. It pushes you to go further as a writer. Come on, you can do this and you can actually, to be able, you know, it's so it's over to the public, the Ransom Center, of course, and you can just go in there and sit in front of Edward Gorey's sketches. And it's amazing, but not just Gorey, there's Thackeray, for God's sake, Thackeray sketches as well, which is, you know, which is so amazing. Because I, I, I don't know if it's absolutely true, but Thackeray apparently, or um, uh, the, the, the great writer Alberto Manguel was telling me that he wrote Vanity Fair and illustrated it originally because he wasn't, Dickens did not give him permission to illustrate his work. So he went, right, oh, wow. I'll write Vanity Fair then. Oh, and we're very, we're very lucky. 
lucky. We're very lucky to have that. But the fact that you can visit those um, those drawings, but also Cocteau as well, Cocteau's own illustrations. I mean, there's and Lewis Carroll's early, there's some of his drawings as well. And even though, of course, um, Tineal is the, the illustrator we associate with uh, Alice, but still, Lewis Carroll did his own illustrations to them. So yeah, there's tons in the Ransom Center. The one just feel like, you know, it, it, it's it's also that kind of blessing. Yeah, I would say this as, as someone who draws as well as writes, but amongst all the manuscripts, there's these wonderful pieces of art as well. So I want to go back to the Swallow Man for a uh, minute. And in that novel, Geppetto curates a museum of artifacts that belong to Harold Tugthus, the former captain of the swallowed ship, the Maria, that Geppetto makes his home in the belly of the shark. There's kind of then another sort of nested museums in this book. In the books afterward, we learn that Dr. Green discovers the creations Geppetto left behind in the now dead shark and in turn opens the Fish House Museum to display them. Can you take a few minutes to tour us through what visitors to that imaginary Fish House Museum would see? And let me just um, scroll ahead to some of the other images you, that Geppetto created while he was in the shark and that presumably are now on display in the Fish House Museum. Yeah, so, so this is what um, Geppetto decides is that he could either eat or make art and um, or live and his home is this ship and he pulls the ship apart to use it as surfaces and this portrait again showing his um, showing Pinocchio as a as a child with his with his um, uh, with his particular nose is pulled from the ship. Um, so he's destroying his home, and all, but so that he can make art, but can, you know, we, so he can express himself, so he can still be himself, so he can still be a human being. So in this, in in, in Vinyl Haven, um, the 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 island where where um, in Maine where where um, where the the whale, the sh shark, the sea beast eventually washes up, Bream opens it up, finds the objects, and has them permanently. On, on display. And you can imagine, he says, the smell of the place. It stinks of, of, of sort of rotting fish, but he, he's, preserved, he's preserved these paintings. So yes, there's this. Um, I don't know what, I can't, do you want to go on to there? There we go. This is the bone I, this is the bone I mentioned earlier. Um, so that he's painted this, this sky shape. A skyscape um, on it that he can, you know, that he can look into it. He calls it his window. This is, you know, this is where this is where he can escape. Um, but there's all sorts of little things, large things, and this. Oh, so at one point, you know, it's just him. But at one point, he discovers that there is a crab living in his beard, a small crab called Olivia. He names it Olivia. Um, and he he um, he adores. It's, it, she's sort of like a cat to him. He pats he pats pats her and and talks to her, but she dies. Um, she's small. She's small, and you know, and and, and didn't, doesn't live very long. And this is a memorial painting, I suppose, rather like the the the, the memorial of the uh, of the hair or of the of the piece of wood um, or of the drawing on vellum. Um, but this is his memorial to uh, his companion. And, and then, what's so, the story about Otto? <laughs> so this is Otto. Um, he creates Otto. Um, now Otto is made um, from pieces of found pottery on the on on mostly on the banks of the Thames at low tide. Uh, the 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 Thames is a tidal river and. Um, me and my family are fully licensed to go uh, mudlarking, which is a Victorian term, which means you are licensed to go and pick up what's in the mud um, at low tide. And it's one of my greatest, greatest joys and all of my family's greatest joys is to go down there and you can find all sorts of wonders, bits of Roman uh, mosaic. Uh, my son found a Tudor coin from Elizabeth the first reign and you can find all sorts of things. And it really is, a, it's amazing. It's like going to the ransom center, you're touching history. It's absolutely fabulous going down on, into the mud. Um, and I collected all these bits of um, uh, pottery 
and I made it into this figure because I thought, uh, as you mentioned, you know, the, sh the, the shark is, is eating all the time. And I wondered if these shards came in with the post um, and that Geppetto keeps them all and constructs another child. Um, he's questioning his role as a father um, throughout, the, throughout the book. And he creates this, this child and makes a story up about him. He has no books himself, so he has to make his own stories. Um, and so I created, I, I made this um, this figure out of out of the shattered remains that we picked up from from the Thames foreshore, but also from um, uh, from from Tobermory, Tobermory Harbour on the Isle of Mull in Scotland, um, and from um, and from Provincetown in Massachusetts. I have the scavenger DNA myself, so I'm so jealous of your license to go mudlarking in the Thames. It's easy to get hold of. You can get it and there's nothing more joyful when you get the London Port Authority. Her Majesty has given you permission to go and, 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 and potter in the mud. That's wonderful. So I'm going to end the tour of the Fish House Museum, but not quite the end of the program, with this lovely uh, watercolor portrait of Pinocchio. And I'm, I don't think this is something that Geppetto painted while he was in the shark, but rather um, when he thought, he knew that Pinocchio had been washed out to sea and might have washed up, drowned on a beach. Um, yeah. I just think it's a, a lovely effective portrait of sort of the full marionette Pinocchio. Where does this actually, am I correct in where this place is placed in the book? Yeah, no, you are, and I think he's desperately he's desperately wondering whether whether he's alive or dead. And I think the and I hoped in this in this picture to the answer could be either. Um, and the and the, and the, and the, the, there he is, just sort of. He could be sleeping. He could be sleeping. This full this full this full wooden creature. Um, but one of the joys of being in in, in Florence, um, as I was working on on so much of this, was discovering Michelangelo Buonarroti's amazing sculpture that he did as a young man of Christ, um, carved out of wood from a linden tree, and it's in in Santo Spirito, and it's so beautiful. And you go and see it, and I and I of course I had nothing but Pinocchio on my mind. But suddenly I thought, you know, Florence is a city of Pinocchio. Um, and um, and Pinocchio is very very Tuscan. Um, for example, Babo is the is the is the is the Tuscan is the Tuscan word for father. Um, and I just suddenly, when seeing Michelangelo's uh, Christ, I thought, oh, and please don't think this is sacrilegious, but I thought <laughs> Pinocchio. Um, I was actually found it incredibly moving, and this wooden life. Um, seem to seem very much linked with the with the with the with the talking, moving, living object. You know, if if, if William Blake's the patron saint of artists, writers, then surely Pinocchio is the patron saint of objects, of all objects. Um, um, the most extraordinary one. You know, is he the most extraordinary object in literature? Surely he must be. Damn close. If not, if not, you know, how can one judge such thing? But he is such this amazing object that wants to live, um, and so here he is between life and death. And I think that was what I found so moving when I was working at the children's hospital in 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 Florence. It's that whole business of 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 life and death, and the and and the clinging and the clinging to life that I think is so much the 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 background the spine of of Claudie's extraordinarily dark and difficult book it's not if you haven't read the um the actual book uh it's so different in tone to the to the the disney the disney um the disney version for example um uh, uh, pinocchio is is something of a of a of a, of a of a monster himself i mean he screams and is disobedient and uh is is a, is a, is an urchin and, and is is bad news but he's full, he's full of life yeah <laughs> well i'm going to end the tour of the fish house museum and go back to um sharing a fuller screen i think i'm going to do this um Just going to close that out. And we're close to um, 
I think probably a, a Q and A session, but I want to ask you one final question. Um, and it goes back to our ambitions to work together in creating an exhibition at the Ransom Center. And we certainly hope to work in future with you on doing just that. But I wondered if you could give us uh, just a couple of ideas about what kind of exhibition you might craft for the center based on its collections. Well, I was thinking about this and, I, I, and God, I would love to do, I have to say nothing would give me greater pleasure than to, 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 to work with you and to work with the Ransom Center. And I was thinking, you know, one of the things I would love to, of course, I would love to do an exhibition on writer artists. You have so many writer artists um, collection and it would be such fun just to go, Look, did you guys know that Sebastian Barry paints as well? You know, there's all sorts of, you know, endless number of, of people um, who, who you have. Many of them I've mentioned already, Coxo, Gory, Thackeray, of course, Blake, all these people. The other, the other choice, though, I was thinking um, is that, and I was, I was kind of thinking something you said when, ages ago, when we talked about, we were talking about John Fowles' desk. Uh -huh. and, you mentioned that they hadn't emptied the drawers when it arrived and there were still objects inside it. And I would love to do a sort of tour of strange objects that are inside the, the Ransom Center. So that you would have the hair, that you would have, you know, those, there's something about that tactile nature of objects. And I was thinking that recently in an ex, relatively recently in an exhibition, of course, time is so bent and destroyed for all of us now. Um, you exhibited Kazuo Ishiguri's typewriter on mm -hmm. which he wrote the remains of the day. And I just think that I remember with such clarity, that object, and also Crace's, Jim Crace's little bits of driftwood. I would love to kind of go through as if it was the banks of the of <laughs> low tide and go, can we have this, can we have that, and create a sort of strange, a strange scape of, of odd objects that you have, including whatever was in John Fowles' desk drawer. Um, Brass knuckles, among other things. Right. <laughs> yeah, you could go mudlarking through the ransom center right. <laughs> and see what you could come up with. Um, well, I don't see any questions coming in, but I think this would be a wonderful opportunity for us to give you a chance to read from The Swallow Man so that any of our listeners who have not yet picked it up um, will get a sort of a little teaser on what they can expect when they do read it. So I'm going to just turn um, the time over to you to read from The Swallowed Man. How would you like me to, how long do you want me to read for? Uh, I'm not entirely sure, maybe 10 minutes. Okay, well, why don't I do two, two, two little sections? Okay. That sounds great. Fabulous. Okay, so this is this is this is right from the um, this is right from the beginning of the book. This is this is how it starts. I am writing this account in another man's book by candlelight inside the belly of a fish. I have been eaten. I have been eaten, yet I am living still. I've tried to get out. I've made many attempts, but I must conclude that it is not possible. I am trapped within an enormous creature and am slowly being digested. I have found a strange place to exist, a cave between life and death. It is an unhappy miracle. I am afraid of the dark. The dark is coming for me. I have candles, they are my small protection, and I have this poloid book that I shall slowly fill. Before the last candle dies, I'll tell my tale. I give you fair warning. I can boast you no battlefields. This is no murderous story. There is no great romance. But before all this back on land, I did an extraordinary thing, an impossible thing. And for that thing, in order that the world may be put back in balance, I am now paying a severe cost. I shall tell my terrible shame, my tale of the supernatural, though so devastatingly 
real. Okay. And then later on in the book, he, he remembers his time um, with, uh, with Pinocchio. And this is him talking to Pinocchio. Um, uh, and as I mentioned, when we, when we hear Babo, that's the, the, that's the Tuscan word for, for father. In the hours we had together, we played our game. At times I allowed it, it liked that best of all. What is a human? It asked, I am a human, teach me to be one. I could not convince it by words, I must show, I must demonstrate. If you're to be a child, you must sit up. There then, and it did, creaked into position. That is the least of it. You must also be good or else the stick. Well, and what then? It said, say your prayers. I'll do it. Very well, let me hear you. Dear father, beloved Barbo, unhappy daddy, please unlock the door, amen. I can't let you out, you'll run away. I shall not, I promise. I observed the nose, it moved not. To be certain, I measured it four inches and a little bit. Child, we carried on with our game. Children go to school, then I shall go to school. They learn their lessons, then so shall I. It would be ridiculous, I said, laughing at the idea, but look there, a seed growing in my head. I would like to try, please, sir, you will run away. No, no, I shall not. I observed, I measured inches, four and a little bit. No, I said finally, help me. You can help, sir, father, you know I can. I could come up with no other response. So I did the only thing I could think of. I locked him in and I went outside. There I could think I was having ideas. As I walked, I confess, I began to dream of money, a deal of money that might suddenly be within reach. And why not? I deserved it, didn't I? After all these lean years, I was the maker, I alone. But first, I had some things to do. To get more money, you must start by investing a little, I thought. So I took my own coat down to Master Powerly's store, the greatest shop in all Kalodi. Almost anything can be purchased there, and sold it. With the money from the coat, I bought from Powerly's some second-hand children's clothes and something else, a school book. And then, full that I was, I carried them all home. We clothe our children so they may fit in. Do we not? I showed him the clothes and his wooden eyes seemed to grow. He reached out and put them on a little baggy, but they fit well enough. The sight of him clothed made my eyes itch so much more convincing, wearing a pair of old shorts, the collarless shirt. How splendid to see a stick turning the pages of a school book. Yes, I thought there was a trial. If I bought this wood life to school, how would the children react? They'd not keep quiet, that was certain. They'd spread the news. The wooden child would become famous first in Kalodi, then throughout the world. And because of it, I too. It would be the most wonderful business. I had no understanding of the danger, not yet. I took the screw eye from the back, um, from out of his back. You no longer need this, my good boy. So he, I began to call him he, you see, I went that way at last. And so yes, he would go into the world after all this thing of mine, my mannequin. It is time for you to go to school my little boy of pine. Father, what is my name? I should have a name if I'm going to school. Puppet, that's not a name. Wooden monster, I thought, haunted spirit begot from loneliness, impossible life, miracle and curse, spectre, stump. But I said, wood chip, wood louse, sawdust, shaving, lumber life, kindling, pine pit, yes, there must be some pine, some pino in the name, pinospero, pinocido, pinorizio, no, just plain pino, only pine, for that is you, or for fondness to add a nut, a noce, Pinocchio. Pinocchio, he asked, excited, yes, then, Pinocchio, Pinocchio, it is time for school, Pinocchio, goodbye, Barbo. 
Goodbye, Pinocchio. I opened the door. How the light rushed in through the oblong and I watched him walk out into the world to see him so illuminated. Down the street he went, out of my reach towards the schoolhouse. I watched the breeze ruffle his clothes as if the wind supposed he was one of us. To think I had made such a creature that set forth this way on his own feet. How well I thought I shall be known for it. How celebrated the creator of life. I shall be rich, I think. I watched him go, his wooden gait, his upright form trying to be flesh. What a thing. He walked as if he belonged to the world. I did not call him back and off he creeped. As I watched, it quite broke my heart to see him so excited with his school book as if he were equal to any other. Off, impossible thing. Yes, off to school, how I waited, but he never. I lost my life. He never came back. All company, gone. I've not seen him since, unless in a dream be counted. <laughs> Thank you so very, very much um, for participating in today's conversation and for ending with that wonderful, wonderful reading. Uh, thanks everyone who joined us this afternoon, and I very much encourage you uh, to go out and get a copy and read The Swallowed Man. I so enjoyed doing so myself. Thank you again, Edward. This was just absolutely delightful. Thank you so much, Kathy. This was a real joy. Such a joy to see you. Such a joy to see you in the Ransom Center as well. <laughs> well eventually we'll be in again. person again. Yeah. So, <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, thank you again, and uh, thanks everyone for joining us in today's uh, Ransom Center Collection Connections. And I'll, with that, I'll just say good night and good health.